Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, now John is here also. So welcome everybody. And this is the I don't know the fifth meeting for this year. So in total, I guess we have like fifty meetings or something like that. And we are, as I guess most people are aware of, we're in the middle of CASP season. So we are starting CASP. So people are busy or getting things debugged, but I'm sure, glad to see so many people here anyway. And uh, this is uh, the second or last meeting before summer, because I thought we should have a summer break or a CASP break in July and August. So we have time to do other things. But if someone wants to run it in July or August themselves, I can provide it with some link, but I will not guarantee that I'm, I'll be there. So the, today we have uh, Kristen Lindorf Larsen. We're going to talk about, actually, we don't have a title, but we, we, we're going to talk about uh, certainly something with disordered proteins and structural variation and AI methods for that. So I, mean, I think it, I mean, there's a lot of exciting works coming from his lab. So I'll, um, yeah, please go ahead and start. Wonderful. Thank you. I realized that I forgot to give you a title, but I will, uh, I have a title on my title slide at least. Uh, here we, no, that's the wrong window. Here we go. All right, and then I'm seeing a lot of things here. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot, Anne, and thanks a lot for everybody else for coming. So this is the, the title, although this will only be a, a fraction uh, of the talk, uh, Confirmational Examples of the Human Intrinsically Disordered Proteome. Um, as Anne uh, said, my name is Christian Hinter Blasen. I uh, am a professor here at the University of Copenhagen, where we work a lot on on integrating experiments and simulations to study protein structure and 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 dynamics, uh, including on on these very disordered flexible uh, proteins. Uh, great. I will just get my laser pointer here. So, <clears throat> I think almost everything that actually probably everything that I will talk about is uh, published at least as a preprint. Um, so, you know, if you don't take notes or if there's something you want to go back and look at, uh, you know, it should all be there, you know, in some paper and also just all the data and all the code should also all be available. So we basically have a GitHub repository for each uh, paper preprint with all the data and all the code that, that has been used. So if you find any of what I'm talking about uh, useful, you should be able to find it. And if you can't find it, it's typically, you know, because we made a mistake and not made it available. So just uh, bug us and we'll, we'll, we'll take out, take out the things. So the menu uh, for today is uh, maybe a little bit uh, ambitious, uh, but, but I, 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 I plan on, on making it through at least most of it. Um, so we'll be talking mostly about these highly flexible uh, disordered proteins. And as I'll uh, introduce early on, uh, one of the ways of, of studying this uh, involves using molecular simulations. And in particular, I'll talk about how we can you know, use cross screen simulations to study their structural dynamics. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we've used this cross screen model to study the relationship between sequence and structure, first by simulations and then by learning some rules. Uh, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how we've sort of you know, flipped uh, the arrow uh, in the same way as, you know, in the context of all the proteins, uh, where we sort of go from, from, from structure to sequence. So designing uh, sequences with specific structural properties, but again, in the context of these uh, disordered proteins. Um, that's the menu. These are the, the chefs. I'll mention their names uh, as I go along the way, but uh, there's a number of people here that contributed to many of them, and I will sort of highlight uh, the key people involved as, as I as I go along, um, but you know, and then at the end, you know, mention all the others that that that, that contributed. Um, for those of you who are not familiar necessarily with the biology of of disordered proteins or intrinsically disordered proteins, uh, I could give you a long introduction to to what they do. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to uh, point you to this very recent and fantastic review uh, written by Alex Holhaus and Peter Carlot. Uh, published uh, very early this year uh, that talks about uh, you know sequence properties, structural ensembles, biological functions, you know all the complexity uh, that these proteins have. They're a very diverse group of things. So 
sometimes it makes sense to talk of them as one group of proteins, but they're really very, very diverse. So they play many, many important biological functions, of course, often in the context of, of, of folded domains also. So, you know, you might know about the nuclear pore complex that has these uh, repeat proteins that sort of act as this mesh. Uh, there's a lot of disorder things involved in gene regulation, transcription factors, and the transactivation domains. Of course, often disordered, they're often involved in, in signaling, binding things, you know, integrating signals from many different things. And, and sometimes you download a crystal structure of a protein and, 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 and you, will, you think that you have the entire structure of it, but then when you look up uh, you know, the actual full sequence, or if you look up the alpha fold prediction, you will find all this spaghetti all over the place. So these are the bits and pieces that tend to be chopped off when people do crystal structures or, or EM structures, or at least are not visible, but often, as, as I mentioned, they play important biological roles. And what I will mention is in them is that in the same way uh, as we think of uh, sort of sequence structure function relationship for folded proteins, the structural properties of disordered proteins also play an essential role in their function. Now, these are very dynamic systems. So instead of talking about structure, we typically talk about conformational ensembles. Of course, many of you will know that that should also be the case for folded domains. But in this case, it really isn't meaningful to think of these as you know, even being represented by a single structure. Um, so there is a relationship between the sequence, of course, and the conformational ensembles. And these conformational ensembles affect many of the biological properties. So you can imagine, for example, if you think of some protein, the two folded domains, and there's some kind of flexible linker in between them, the properties of this linker will, of course, determine how much these two domains interact with one another, or if one can bind a substrate and the other can be a catalytic domain, how the substrate and the catalytic domain will sort of come together. Now I can see that Shoshana is drawing on my slides. I hope that you know, uh, you know, doesn't become too much. Um, then uh, you know, so we want and need to characterize the conformational ensembles of of disordered proteins, uh, but uh, that's not always so easy from from experiments. And in fact, I think that it's sometimes useful to think of uh, you know characterizing these proteins. Uh, in contrast to the way that we are now used to thinking about these things in the context of folded proteins. So we think about the information that goes in to drive you know, high accuracy structure prediction of folded domains. The information, of course, comes mainly from two different sources, right? It comes from the fact that we have often relatively deep alignments of sequences uh, and that we have these wonderful databases of you know, nice structures that people have, have determined experimentally. And in the context of disordered proteins, we have generally neither of these. So we don't have the PDB in the sense that disordered proteins don't crystallize. We can't determine you know, nice structures of them experimentally. At least it's very hard. And so we don't, they're not really represented well in the PDB, apart from you know, small bits and pieces that tend to stick to other proteins. There is an example database that is relatively small and very heterogeneous in terms of the methods. So we don't have structures. Um, the other thing that we don't have is that we don't have you know, good alignments, not because we don't have many sequences, but because they're not very easy to align. And so this kind of positional conservation paradigm that works so well for folded proteins, that doesn't really work so well uh, for disordered proteins. And so while we have many sequences, we don't always have the tools of reading those sequences in a way that can leverage uh, sequence information across uh, orthologs. And even finding orthologs can be, can be very difficult. So instead of doing that, what we did, decided to do uh, was instead of train on, on structures and, and sequences, we have sort of to go one step back, which is to train our models directly against the experimental data. And so instead of saying, you know, we have some confirmational examples that we can download it from a database, we have to really go to sort of the, the source of the information that, that, that is used to study structure. And this is work that, you know, started actually quite many years ago in my group, but was then picked up again when Ramon Crevet was, uh, you know, on a sabbatical in Copenhagen working together with, with Tia Schulze, who was then uh, an undergraduate student, 
uh, and then later on again picked up by Julio to say who has sort of been running with this project later on. So what I will first talk about is how we've been able to train a model, and this model is actually a physical simulation model on single chain conformational properties that we measure, or the field measures by experiments, and I'll talk about the mechanisms of how we do this. And then I will talk very briefly uh, about how we can use this method to study not just conformational ensembles of individual disorder proteins, but also their ability to self-associate and form what's known as as, 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 as biomolecular quantities. This is something we work on a lot, but I won't actually talk so much about it beyond just you know, flashing that this is one of the key motivations uh, to develop this model. And so just again, to motivate this, and uh, this is uh, physically maybe not so, so, uh, uh, so, so surprising, but if we can learn a molecular force field by looking at individual isolated chains or monomeric proteins, we can learn the rules of intramolecular interactions. But of course, if you have an assembly of, of chains, of course, it's the same physics that driving intermolecular interactions. And so it's a little bit easier to perform simulations of individual proteins and also easier to measure structural data on individual proteins. But then we can use the same physics to study interactions between uh, different chains. And I'll just show you briefly how, how we can validate that. This is not something we grab completely out of the air. In fact, that there is very nice work for many people dating all ready back to sort of long ago polymer theory, but more recently, uh, you know, these kind of papers that sort of use either various types of theory or, or core screen simulations or experiments from other groups showed that there's a very strong correlation between what's on the x-axis here, which basically are measurements of conformational properties of individual chains. So how compact a disordered protein is, whether it's a compact chain or a very expanded chain. And that is then highly correlated with these molecules' propensity to undergo phase separation. That means that they self-associate with other copies of itself. So if we can learn the rules that govern the stuff on the x-axis, which is sort of the, 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 how the individual chains uh, operate, we can also predict how things self-associate, that's the stuff on the, on the y-axis. So there's you know, some motivation on, on doing this. So the model that we're using is again, not a model that we came up with. It builds on you know, some work we did many years ago, but, uh, but you know, it was really reinvented and pioneered by, by, by a number of other groups. Uh, and I'm just highlighting here one, one very nice paper from joint work between TT and Metal and Rob Best's group uh, from, from now five or six years ago. Uh, on a model that is very simple, but I hopefully convince you can be, be pretty powerful, where we represent each residue as a single bead. So it's very coarse grain, but it has sequence. And those beads have a couple of properties that have a size. They have charge, if they're charged amino acids that we deal with, with a very simple implicit solvent, uh, the bipipal term that has electrostatics in it. And then the different residue types are characterized mostly by a single parameter that just says whether that residue is sort of sticky, whether it likes to stick to other things, or whether it's not so sticky, meaning that it likes to interact sort of with, with the solvent that we are here representing, as I said, uh, uh, not, not explicitly. Um, and on this specific, specific scale, this is not the scale that we'll use. You can just see that they're organized by this hydropathy parameter lambda with some sticky residues. In this particular scale, it's phenylalanine, proline, and isoleucine that are the most sticky, and then arginine, aspartate, asparagine are sort of the least uh, sticky residues here. So there's this parameter lambda that characterizes you know, the, the main properties of the model, which is how sticky the different amino acids uh, would be. And so what we will do is that we will replace this scale with a scale that we instead learn from experimental data. So as I said, right, we can't go to doctoral databases, so we have to go to sort of the experimental data. And so we, we came up with an approach of how we can learn the parameters of a force field by benchmarking and testing comparatively you know, directly against experiments. And in fact, this is something that we worked on. This is now you know, more than 15 years ago, you know, a master's student working many years ago where there was very little experimental data, but he came up with this algorithm, which is pretty simple, uh, which is that we can write down sort of a likelihood function here that I mean, no, this is the log likelihood function of some force field parameters, and we can formulate this in a nice Bayesian fashion. And it has, uh, two terms. It has these first two terms here, which measures how close would a simulation with a given force field predict experimental data, either from small angular x-ray scattering, radii of gyration, 
or PREs, which are NMR measurements, paramagnetic relaxation enhancement measurements. Uh, how well can a force field predict those data? So that's sort of the, you know, the, the one part of the likelihood function. And then this other part here is sort of a prior. This is what would our expectation be of these sort of stickiness parameters, you know, just if we think about the chemistry that we understand of the different amino acids. So we have some kind of force field that is characterized by the lambdas. And then we can run simulations. We can, we can predict conformational properties that we can compare with the raw experimental data or semi-raw experimental data. If then they don't agree with each other, which they won't do because our initial force field is not very good, we can nudge the parameters uh, a little bit, and then we can run a new set of, of simulations. And then we can iterate over and over on that. That, of course, sounds a little bit expensive because each time we have a new you know, set of force field parameters, we need to run simulations. And the simulations are fast because they're coarse grained, but they're still not infinitely fast. But then we have various tricks uh, to sort of reuse simulations so we can sort of do what's called statistical reweighting. And that means that we can really you know, decrease the, the, the computational requirements. And in fact, we can reparameterize an entire force field pretty much automated in a matter of a few days with a relatively low amount of computational resources. So this is work that you know, published many years ago and sort of we refined it uh, more recently. So the first thing is sort of to figure out you know, what data we should look at. We went to the literature. This is now a little bit old, but we have experimental data on a little bit more than 100 different proteins now. Most of it is radii of gyration from small angular X-ray scattering. Um, then we have, as I mentioned, NMR data that we can characterize also that says something about you know, long range interactions. And then a few proteins for which we have both NMR and, and small angular X-ray scattering data. So we have, as I'll show you, enough data to parameterize 20 parameters, which is you know, all that's needed in this very simple model. And so again, if you think of it in the context of machine learning, right, we have a, a model that we need to characterize you know, very many different sequences. And of course, we don't have so much data. And so we put very strong restrictions on the model space or you know, the machine learning you know, lingo, this would be you know, very strong inductive biases. So we basically have a physical model with a very, you know, that's not very flexible because we don't have so much data uh, to trade on. And then we have this, these priors that I mentioned, and we basically went to the you know, literature and found uh, 70 different hydrobicity scales. And we use that as the prior. So all other things being equal, we would expect that aspartate is not a very sticky residue and tryptophan is a pretty sticky residue. This holds, holds true as I'll show you then, but then we have other things like arginine, which actually we might expect to be not such a sticky residue based on the standard ways we think of the chemistry. But in fact, in the context of disordered protein, actually arginine really likes to interact with other things. So this is something that will actually move quite far away from the prior because that's what the data will, will, will show. Um, so instead of giving you a lot of more technical details, I'll just show you in a movie you know, how this operates on the top left of what will be a, a movie that will play in a few seconds. He, the other the parameters of the model. Uh, these are the initial parameters that I showed before. And then we will be optimizing the parameters. So these balls will be, be jumping up and down as we optimize. On the top right, I'm showing the agreement between simulation and experiment on just one you know, one specific experiment, this is a PIE experiment on alpha cyanuclein. And the fact that the red points lie lower than the black points means that alpha cyanuclein with this specific force field is forming much more structure than what the experiment tells us. And this you can also see in the bottom right, which shows that the radius of gyration uh, indicated with this red uh, arrow um, is a lot smaller than what we measure experimentally, which is this black line down here. So now the movie here, you can see that you know, we have a simulation of alpha synuclein, but we are targeting not just the alpha synuclein, but you know, data on 50 different proteins. We can see that as the force field at the top left is sort of optimizing, we now get to a solution where we fit the experimental data, not just on alpha synuclein, this is what I'm showing here, but at the same time, we are really fitting experimental data on 50 uh, different proteins, and many of them contribute with many measurements. So there's quite a lot of data. And you can see that the outcome is somewhat different from what we started with. So again, you can see here that the aromatic residues, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine are pretty sticky. But you can also see, for example, over here, that arginine moved from being you know, very non-sticky to being one of the more sticky residues. This is not something that you know, was new. This is something that other people had seen. But this falls sort of automatically out of, 
of this optimization algorithm. So how well does this work? Well, this is the agreement between the, you know, the, the simulation and the experiments. Uh, you can see we have basically a perfect uh, correlation across the training data. Um, this is not so difficult because it's not so difficult to predict that a protein with you know, 20 or 30 residues is a lot smaller uh, than a protein with several hundred residues. So this, you, know, you would basically get by scaling law. But then if you zoom in on this little box here, these are actually variants of the same protein with the same length, but different sequence uh, composition and, and patterning uh, measured mostly from, from Tanya Mittag's lab or probably exclusively. And you can get here, we get a pretty good correlation uh, between experiments and simulations of proteins that are exactly the same length. Now, this is the data that we were, we were, we were uh, training on. Uh, here's data that we you know, either didn't exist or didn't know about or didn't look at before. So this is testing data, and you can again see we have a pretty good agreement with SACS data. We can also compare with data measured by other techniques, for example, uh, FRED data. Here's some data. These are just variants of the same protein where, 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 where Richard Krivaki and Rohit Papu's group you know, swapped around the charged amino acids and recorded SACS data. Again, you can see we have a very good agreement. And what I'll show you over here is actually some sequences that we designed that I'll return to at the end using the simulation model, went into the lab, made the proteins, measured their compaction. And again, you can see that for these design proteins, we have a very high correlation. Um, so we think that this model is pretty good at predicting long range structure uh, in, in, in this order of proteins. So we've learned these, these molecular interactions between the different amino acids. As I mentioned, we can use this also to study interaction in trends between different chains. So we can run simulations and we can see proteins self-associate. This is something you can also measure experimentally. And this again is just to show you that when we train the model on the single chain interactions and learn the physics, we can then transfer that physics to look at interactions between chains. And again, we see a very nice correlation between a measurement of the tendency of different proteins and protein variants uh, to self-associate. So again, you know, we can use this model to study uh, properties such as phase separation of all oligomerization of, of, of disordered proteins. <clears throat> The code is available, so there's a GitHub repo that you can just download if you are just interested in running a few chains. Actually, the simulation mod is so fast that you can actually run it easily on Colab. It will take anywhere between 15 minutes and maybe you know 50 minutes, depending on how, how long your protein is. I mean, you will run you know simple automated analyses where you will give you conformational ensembles, or you can use it if you want to do teaching of molecular dynamics. You know, you have basically a tool. Um, for generating conformational ensembles where you run actual molecular dynamic simulations, but on sort of a simple, you know, mostly free uh, resource. Everything that I've told you about now is only disordered proteins. Of course, many proteins, you know, you know, in biology have mixtures of order and disorder. And since we have now all these wonderful tools to predict the structure of the folded domains, um, we also wanted to extend the model to, to study these kind of multi-domain proteins. I won't really talk much about it uh, beyond just say that we have a model now uh, where uh, we can study proteins with folded domains and flexible linkers in between them. And this is work uh, mostly by Van Kao, but together with others in the group uh, that shows that we can now also simulate these things. We keep the folded domains, sort of the structure of those fixed with sort of harmonic networks. And then we let the flexible bits be, be, be flexible. And then we can also run molecular simulations of this. There's a few tricks that we sort of learned along the way. The most important trick is just illustrated here, which is that when we represent folded domains with one bead per residue, it's a really bad idea to put the interaction sites on the C alphas, because that means that if you have something like a beta strand with alternating hydrophobics sticking in uh, towards the protein and polar residue sticking out, you are basically moving the hydrophobic interaction sites onto the surface and that means that you create sort of hydrophobic patches on the surface, in particular of beta sheet proteins, and that doesn't work so well. But if you then represent just the, the, the folded domains with one bead per residue that's located at the center of mass of the protein, actually you get a really good agreement with, the, for example, the, the, the things that you measure by small angular X-ray scattering, both of the disordered proteins, this is what I showed you previously, but also for the, for the multi-domain proteins, these are the 
uh, the, the, the green squares on, on, on this plot here. So we can really simulate quite accurately multiple domain proteins uh, with, with this kind of model also, but I won't really tell you more about this, but there's a preprint as, 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 as is linked here. All right, so this was sort of the introduction to the methods and now I'll go through some applications of what we can do with this model. And I'll give you not all the details, again, uh, a lot of it is, is, is published or preprinted, I'll just sort of roughly divide it in to sort of you know two 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 directions of this error. Right? How can we learn sequence structure or sequence ensemble relationships will cover us, and then at the end, sort of you know how can we go from structural properties to generate uh, sequences? And you know you probably all know this, but if you don't, just a reminder that AlphaFold is an amazing tool for predicting protein structure. But when AlphaFold isn't sure where the atom should be, it typically means that they're dynamic. And so the PLDTT scores or other properties of alpha ball structures are actually extremely good predictors of, of which parts of a protein is disordered. And so we've used this in the work, uh, basically to use the pre-existing alpha ball predictions to figure out which bits of, of the human proteome we should consider to be uh, disordered. So this is you know, using just the PLDTT scores in this more recent paper that you know probably several of you are, are co-authors of, uh, it was shown that you can use AlphaFold in a slightly more refined way, and you can squeeze out a little bit more of prediction accuracy by either doing window averaging or taking the solvent accessible surface area or, or other things uh, from, 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 from the predictions. So with these tools in hand, uh, Julio and, and, and Aida uh, Tolle uh, worked together uh, initially, and then other people in the group sort of came on board um, to try to, to use this tool to study not just a few proteins, but, but try to study uh, basically all the intrinsically disordered regions from the human proteome. So because the model is fast, it's actually not, you know, not impossible to just simulate thousands and thousands of sequences. So at least in this initial work, what we did is we took all the disordered regions from the 20 odd thousand uh, human proteins, cut them out, and vein molecular dynamic simulations of all of them in the context of the just the disorder bits, so without the folded domains. And of course, there are approximations in that that we can, can discuss uh, later. So that turns out to be about 28,000 sequences. So we have 28,000 molecular dynamic simulations of each of these, uh, you know, of these disorder proteins that we can then characterize. A lot of what I'll do is that I'll boil down a very complicated confirmation ensemble into a single number. Um, so we will have 28,000 numbers, then the number will be the scaling exponent, which is a number that says something about how compact a disorder thing is, but that's independent of length. So if the scaling exponent is 0.5, it means that the protein on average likes itself as much as it likes the solvent around it. If the scaling exponent is greater than 0.5, it means that it likes water a little bit more than it likes itself, which means that it's expanded. And if it's smaller than 0.5, it means that the protein likes itself you know, some more than it likes the solvent, which means that it's sort of compact. And so this is the number that you know, we'll refer to. Uh, in the case of a homopolymer, these are, you know, that's basically everything you want to know. In case of heteropolymers like proteins, you know, of course, there's more structure to this. So this is now the distribution of, of scaling exponents for 28,000 sequences that we run simulations of. Most of them are sort of you know, somewhere in the middle, that's about two thirds, uh, about one third uh, are, are sort of quite expanded. And then you know, just a small fraction of them uh, have sequence properties that make them quite compact, which means, for example, that they like to interact with themselves, either in cis or in trans. So this includes also a bunch of sequences, for example, that, 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 that can face separate. So this is just, again, you know, just looking across the entire human proteome at one number. If you're interested in looking at more information, we can calculate things like contact maps or average interaction energy maps. So here are you know, 12 uh, such contact maps. Uh, you, know, you can look at the rest of the 28,000 yourself. They're all sitting on the database that we made available, but it goes from, from things like this up the top left that are very compact. So this is a protein that is on average about as compact as a globular protein, and it has a lot of interactions between residues. You know, many of them are charged residues that will drive long-range compaction. You know, to something sort of in the middle here is, for example, the you know, a disordered region from from mediator that sort of has an intermediate level of compaction. 
um, to other things down here, prothymus and alpha, other things that are sort of quite expanded because they're also have many charge residues, but often of the same charge that make them sort of very expanded. And so you can see that there's in many cases actually you know, some structure to these things. So it's not just random stuff, but that there's residues that really like to interact with each other. And as I'll tell you, you know, soon, this will be driven both by where the hydrophobic residues are located in the protein and also where the charged residues are located in the protein and how they're patterned uh, relative to each other. So of course, this is you know, 12 uh, examples. And of course, it gets a little bit tedious to look at, at all of them. And um, so we wanted to, to make things a little bit more, more, more systematic. One of the things we looked at, again, was to sort of how, how do these confirmational examples compare to properties that you might get out from a tool such as, as AlphaFold. So for example, if you calculate the variance of you know, the positions of, of two residues, sort of the, the standard deviation of the confirmational ensemble, you know, on a per residue pair basis, this is shown here at the top left from the simulations. You can compare that, for example, to sort of the, just the machine learning output of AlphaFold, the, the PAE matrix. And you can see that there is some kind of agreement, obviously things that are close along each other in, in sequence are also often close in space. And there's a little bit of structure here, long range that's sort of a little bit reflected over here in the simulations, or rather perhaps reversely, AlphaFold does to some extent predict some of these kind of properties. So if you look at the correlation between the PAE and the actual simulations, there is a reasonable correlation, at least for things that are pretty local. But as you move further and further away from residues that are close you know, in the sequence, that correlation sort of dies off relatively quickly depending on the protein. So again, the AlphaFold PAE matrix sort of reflects to some extent um, structure that's sort of local in sequence, um, if things are sort of like to be together, be more expanded. But as you really look at these more sort of biologically interesting long range interactions, um, you know, maybe AlphaFold doesn't have so much information, then it's it's pretty pretty blind to these things. So for, for I minus J that's sort of large, you really drop to a, a relatively low Pearson correlation between the contact map that you get out from the physics model with what you get out from this PA. And of course, the PA is not you know, meant to be used to predict this, right? So this is maybe not so surprising that it's not a great uh, predictor. So we'll, what we also did is we said, okay, well, what are the physical properties that determine these things, right? So we can run the simulations, but of course, we would also like to understand physically what's going on. And this is something that people have looked at sort of in individual cases or sort of in a series of protein, but now we have a you know, a database of 28,000 quite diverse sequences that we can maybe use to understand some rules. And the rules are not so surprising, but the interplay between them is sort of interesting. So if we take the most expanded proteins, these are the ones on the right of these three different plots with a very high scaling exponent. They are characterized by the fact that they have a high fraction of charged residues. That's maybe not so surprising. If you're highly charged, you can be very expanded. And if you want to make something that is more compact, what you know nature has decided to do or what evolution has decided to do is to get rid of many of the charged residues. So you see sort of a drop in the fraction of charged residues as you move from a high scaling exponent to sort of this kind of intermediate regime. And at the same time, you replace those charged residues with sort of more sticky or hydrophobic residues. So you see a concomitant increase in the hydrophobic residue. So you get a more hydrophobic and less charging, and that is one way of driving uh, compaction. And that's maybe not so surprising. If you want to make things that are even more compact, what then actually happens is that you get rid of some charged residues. So instead of making it much more, so you get rid of some hydrophobic residues, sorry. So instead of making it more hydrophobic, you actually make it less hydrophobic. You start putting back in charged residues. But instead of having those charged residues sort of spread out over the entire protein, what you then do or what evolution has decided to do is to put the charged residues in different blocks. And so again, this is something that we didn't invent. Other people in the Rohit Papus group in particular have, have shown this in, 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 in many cases that if you make these kind of more blocky uh, polymers where you have groups of positives in one region and groups of negative in another region, that will then drive long range interactions that can then drive compaction. So compaction of these disordered protein is driven by this interesting interplay between the fraction of charged residues and their patterning and the number of hydrophobic residues. 
And we think that this is in part because if you make things that are more hydrophobic than this, then these proteins will either aggregate or be recognized by the quality control apparatus and be degraded. And so the alternative is really sort of to use you know, a, a medium level of hyperbicity together with some charged residues to, to, to generate these more interesting compact uh, structures. So these are sort of the, the, the simple rules that determine uh, compaction. This actually means that we now pretty well understand the sequence properties that determine compaction. So we can actually with, I'm almost embarrassed to call it machine learning, but we can sort of write down a predictor that predicts this uh, scaling exponent from just plugging in a small number of these manually sort of selected features using you know, simple support vector regression, but we can actually extremely accurately predict the scaling exponent purely based on sequence without ever running uh, a simulation. And so this is very fast to do. Of course, we can do this easily on thousands and thousands of sequences simply by taking physics motivated features, plug them in a very simple uh, framework and then train a very simple model. And this is now you know, testing on independent test data that you know, we did not look at you know, until we were done with our model. And it, it is basically as accurate as the simulation model. So the kind of spread around this line is basically the difference you get if you run the simulation you know, three or four or five times, you get this kind of spread. So this means that we can now predict, for example, the scaling exponent easily from, uh, from the sequence without actually having to run uh, simulations. This was convenient because while Anna Ida was you know, brave to run molecular simulation of 28,000 proteins, we were not brave enough to run simulation of 1 million proteins. And so the next step we want to say, you know, are these things conserved if you look at past evolution? So we picked out orthologs of many of these IDRs. So we have about a million orthologs for about 26,000 of the 28,000 IDRs. And now we ask the question, are the conformational properties of an IDR that is an ortholog similar to the conformational properties of the human IDR? And that's shown sort of here on the left is that there's a pretty good correlation between, for example, the scaling exponent of a human IDR and the scaling exponent of the orthologs as predicted by this very simple machine learning model that we can then easily run on a million uh, sequences. And the reason why they're you know, conserved is because these key sequence properties that determine compaction, here I'm showing you the sort of the average charge uh, blockiness and the average thickness, you know, they're pretty conserved across evolution in this specific set of orthologs that we picked out. So you know, while the sequences are not maybe conserved in the normal sense of positional conservation, the sequence properties that determine the conformational ensembles are conserved. We looked at many other things in this paper, and I'm not going to go through all the 10, you know, 10 panel supporting figures. I'll just show one thing that we sort of found interesting uh, is something that we're quite interested in is sort of origins of, of, of genetic diseases. And we found, for example, that some properties of the conformational example, for example, sort of an, a rough estimate of the entropy, the conformational entropy of these disordered chains Actually, there is a pretty significant difference between the distribution of, of chains you know, that had pathogenic or, or benign variants, depending on whether they were you know, high or low entropy. So again, the distribution of, 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 of confirmational entropies between proteins with pathogenic variants or the ones with benign variants are sort of quite, quite different. Uh, these are small effects if we then look at what the mutations are actually doing. So here I'm sure using again, or we're using again the, the machine learning model to predict the change in conformational uh, entropy per, per residue with the model. And you can see while that there is a statistically significant difference between the two histograms, the numbers are very, very small. So this is a, a statistical difference that's driven by you know, the fact that we have many, many variants distributed uh, you know, in, 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 in many sequences. Um, and so we can get a high statistical significance, but the, but the numbers are, are very small. So this is not really a strong driver of disease, we think, um, but at least it's interesting that there are different protein behaviors that sort of are more prone to see pathogenic variants versus not. One thing that we did find, and this is again, works nicely together with, with data seen in, in another very nice paper that was published you know, around the same time, this paper down here from Reed Alderson, Oliver, uh, Petrinus Arch, and, and, and Julie Formicay and Alan Moses, 
we found that you know, regions of high PLDDT scores that are sort of interspersed in disordered regions are highly enriched in pathogenic variants. So if you take a disordered region and you find a bit that has a high PLDTT score, you know, the protein is much more sensitive to mutation in those. And this is, again, maybe not so surprising, and this was shown again very nicely in this, uh, this paper that I'm referring to, that these regions are often you know, located you know, either you know, directly and or close to regions that would fold upon binding uh, to, to, for example, fold the domain. So these kind of local uh, motifs that can bind to other things, they will often have high PLTT scores, of course, often because they are conserved, and they will be more sensitive to missense variants than other parts of the protein. So if you look at, at the distribution of PLDT scores within the disordered regions, you can see that there is a peak over here on the pathogenic variants of, of, of individual residues with high PLDT scores that are very different from the benign variants that are sort of you know, more, more, more randomly distributed. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's interesting things to discuss here in terms of how we picked um, the, the, the disorder means, because of course we use the PLDTT scores, um, but again, this is sort of discussed in, in, in the paper. We can pick them in various ways and we do window averaging, but that's you know, something maybe uh, to discuss later. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'll just talk briefly about how we can sort of invert uh, uh, the, the algorithms to say, if we have some structural properties, for example, chain compaction, can we generate sequences that have these kind of properties? And so this is work by Francesco Pesca, and it's the paper is sort of, uh, you know, again, on bioarchive. I'm not going to go through all the technical stuff. There's quite a lot of, of technical stuff that, that we had to do to make this work. But the simple idea is that we start with a protein. We want to make things a little bit hard for ourselves. So we want to keep the amino acid composition constant. So we only allow for swap moves and we do Monte Carlo in sequence space. So we generate permutations of the sequence and we ask, can we change the compaction of the protein by keeping the composition constant, but changing the pattern? And the way that we ask whether a variant is more compact or expanded is we run molecular dynamic simulations. So we do Monte Carlo moves in sequence space. We run molecular dynamic simulations and we try, for example, to drive the protein to become more compact or again later to become more expanded, which just you know revert the, the arrow of the of the Monte Carlo moves. We you know that turns to out to be too slow to do it. So we use again these kind of reweighting tricks. So we don't really we need to run simulations of all the sequence. We only run simulations of about one tenth of these sequences and then we can reuse the simulations. So we can now take a protein, we can move around the amino acids, we can make it quite a bit more compact and then we can expand it again. We've done this for, for, for many different proteins. I'm showing you here four examples, alpha cyanoclein, A1 low complexity domain, LAF1, you know, FUS uh, low complex domain that we can first make more compact and then make more expanded. You know. And in particular, these three proteins have you know, many charged residues. And this I'll show you in a second is driving compaction, whereas this protein doesn't have so many charged residues. And that turns out that it's harder to manipulate their compaction. So what is happening during the, the, the Monte Carlo algorithm, this is sort of easy to explain with this one specific example. If we take this IDR, it has, you know, if we divide it up into three bits, the first bit, the middle bit, and the last bit, each of them is sort of roughly neutral in, in the wild type sequence. But as we let the Monte Carlo or the evolution algorithm sort of evolve, we see that basically all the charge residues move to the end terminus. Uh, uh, the, the, the negatively charged moving towards the C-terminal third, and then the middle third stays sort of more neutral. So we get, again, these kind of charged blocky residues that is then driving uh, compaction. So this is, again, you know, all in the computer. We wanted just to, to check whether, you know, this has any, you know, reality in real life. So Francesco was brave enough uh, to spend some time uh, in the lab, uh, working together with Anna Bremer and Tanya Mittag lab uh, at St. Jude's in Memphis, uh, went there and uh, expressed and purified uh, five of these desired variants uh, and characterized them both in terms of the single chain behavior, but also in terms of their propensity to phase separate. So again, these are the predictions of the model at this in particular, this V1 is, is predicted to be very compact and phase separate quite strongly compared to the wild type, but we sort of spanned you know, a range of compaction, all with proteins that have the same amino acid composition, but just different you know, orders of, of the amino acids. 
and, and, and this is the data that I showed you earlier. Again, V1 through or V2 for V5, we have this very nice correlation between the RG that we measured by small directional scattering data, uh, V1 we measured by NMR. Uh, and the reason why we measured it by NMR, the compaction was that this protein likes itself so much that it just face separates very strongly for a protein of this length. So it really, you cannot create a monomer example of this at a concentration that's high enough to do small angular X-ray scattering. But again, as you can see where there's a pretty good correlation between the predicted uh, propensity to face separate and what we measure in the lab. You know, extraordinary good, I would say. You know, I'm very happy about this outlier here because you know, if there wasn't an outlier, I don't think anybody would really believe these results um, that we get sort of a relatively good prediction uh, from sequences that we generated you know, purely in the computer with this kind of simulation uh, approach. We can do things other than compaction. We can generate sequences that have specific contact maps. So we targeted, for example, this contact map up here uh, of this very compact variant. We started from the protein with this contact map. And again, we can move around the amino acids and have the contact map as the target score. And again, you can see we can generate a sequence that has a very specific contact map, again, with some specific long range interactions. This is all pretty slow. So the last slide that I'll show you with data is that we can then use this machine learning model to predict compaction and use that to drive the design. So this is now the same kind of results, but instead of querying the simulations with simulation, we're now querying them, just asking for this machine learning model to, you know, to say, is the protein more compact or not? And again, we can then make sequences, but of course this is a lot faster and it's again so fast that you can just you know, go to this collab uh, link that I'm giving you here, you can say, this is my starting sequence of, let's say, alpha synuclein. Generate variants that are more compact, and it will start to, to generate sequences that you can then go, go play with in the lab. So this is um, the summary. Um, we've developed a, a coarse grain model. It's very simple. It's pretty accurate for predicting these kind of long-range interactions and interactions between chains. I think because we targeted the experimental data directly, rather than interpretations of the data. I think this is very important for flexible proteins. Um, it's pretty fast, so we've been able to simulate all you know, 28,000 disordered proteins of, of the human disordered uh, proteome. Um, and we've developed also this algorithm that allows us to generate sequences with specific conformational properties. And I showed you some initial examples of this. Um, I mentioned most of the people along the way. Uh, the Calvados work was driven uh, initially by, by Ramon and Tia and, and Julio, and later with contributions from Fan and, and others. Uh, the IDR work was mostly driven by, by Anna and Julio, but really will help for many others in, in various aspects. And then the design work uh, was driven mostly by, by Francesco. And as I mentioned again, the experiments were done in, in Tanya Mitak's lab. And with that, I've come to the end, and I will be happy to discuss uh, and get input. On, on this work, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, I, am I, I, I can start with the questions. Am I, I'm just curious, how is serine in your, in your so stickiness function? Is it, because serine is very overrepresented in, uh, in disordered regions. Yeah, no. I, um, uh, I don't have both. Figure the scale now. I think the only way of showing you the scale okay. is to go back to uh, uh, to the movie. Um, that will be here. So oh, no, the movie has to uh, I was saying, yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of sitting somewhere in here in the middle. So it's not so not nothing extreme. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. So serine is here. It's you know. So serine is you know less sticky than glycine. Again, this is uh, you know what you yeah. see experimentally. Um, for reasons where the physics of this is not, I think, completely understood. But again, yeah, they're relatively solubilizing uh, for these kind of proteins. But of course, one other reason why they are there is that you know you can put phosphate group of them, and then you know many of these series are of course phosphorylated. And I showed yeah. you, I showed you the importance of charge interactions. So of course, a lot of you know, a lot of these long range charge interactions can of course be modulated. By, by, by post translation modifications, as others have shown, and we've also worked on to some extent. Okay, other questions? Otherwise, I can go on. Mm -hmm. like, uh... 
Um, and another curious thing is, of like, I mean, you, you talk about that you could sort of like find the regions, I guess, with alpha poles, where you, but that basically have tendency to bind because you have high yeah. PLS. Yeah, right. And uh, have you have you tested against these databases of SLIMs and so on? If you like, I mean, are there properties of the SLIMs that is that you could get from sequence? That my my accept motif, of course, that sort of like can be used to understand why some regions are binding and some regions are not binding or? We, we, we have not. And in fact, you know, the work that I showed about this conditional form, I mean, that's data from Julie Foreman K's lab. Um, so this is not our, our, our work. Um, and yes, they and others have looked at, at, at SLIMs for these kind of things. And of course, many people have shown that, you know, not us, but, you know, you know many other people have shown that you can, of course, use Alpha Bowl to predict, you know, slim binding, um, even you know, in a single sequence representation. Um, I guess you've also uh, uh, shown this, um, and I guess you know, often one of the issues there is, well, there's two aspects, you know, like with many of these protein-protein interaction things. Is, you know, first of all, first finding the bits that bind, and then finding out how they bind, and 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 uh, I think you know, I think it. It's still a little bit unclear what Alpha Bold is capturing. My suspicion is that it's capturing that these things are conserved, and that's why the PLDTT scores are, are, are high, um, rather than some specific physics of, of what's going on. But probably others know this uh, better than I. We've not looked at this in any in any real detail. But, but, but from your model, you don't see anything specific with slims or non slims. No, we don't. No, we don't. Right? Because we. You know, we deliberately focused on the long range interactions, which means that we don't have a good, we don't have a backbone, so we don't really have a good model for looking oh, okay. at local structure. We can, we're building that in, but of course, that is a, you know, that's a completely separate kind of problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Vim. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Very nice work. Um, so I was wondering because I mean, this is all based on in vitro data, right? In the end, so how how big an effect do you think? the actual in vivo environment the cell will have on this? I mean, beyond post-translation modifications, which you already mentioned, of course. Yeah, um, it's a good question. We've looked a little bit at some things on this. I There's a nice paper recently from Shah Sukhanik that has a nice fluorescent reporter that probes things like chain compaction with FRET. And they show that you get more or less the same result if you look at these proteins in vitro or, or in vivo. Um, of course, the evolution, you know, I think this is one of the nice things about looking at evolution, right, is that evolution cares about stuff that happens in cells. So if there is an evolutionary signal, it probably means that, you know, whatever you're looking at is either happening in cells or is a good proxy of what's happening in, in, in cells. Um, but of course, many of these proteins, what they do, is of course that they interact with other proteins. So I think that the answer to your question is that I think the sort of the single chain properties are often pretty well reflected of what happens in a cell. But of course, what we're not capturing in any reasonable way is the interaction with all the other stuff. And since that's what the IDP is often doing, right? That that picture, of course, is missing. I think from this this paper that I've now highlighted a few times with these folding upon binding kind of reasons. You know, again, if you take this high PLDT as a decent model for what could do conditional folding on bond binding, an estimate is that about 15% of the residues in disordered proteins will do that, which means that 85% of the residues will not do that, right? So most disordered regions will not fold in their whatever they do. And, you know, they will of course support you know, the other other bits, and so I think the polymer properties of those are pretty well represented, you know, uh, by the proteins. Of course, they will be interacting with the folded domains that we here have cut out, and again, there is you know approximations with that. But I think otherwise, I think that when people have tested these kind of rules for what what happens if you change, you know, hydrophobicity or charge, and you study the phenotypes of these things, often you know. Often you see similar kind of patterns, you know, unless you're really probing specific interactions. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can I mean, just one more curious thing is like, I mean, there are sort of like, well, another way to divide the sort of regions are sort of like if there are 
my, my some are more linkage between domains and some are more like really much longer regions. Do you, do you separate things like maybe if you're like N terminal, C terminal linkers or domain things like that? Can you yeah, see some did. patterns? Yes, I mean, yes, we did. We did see some patterns. Again, they, they again fall mostly in this kind of category where you get a, a nice statistical significance because you're looking at many sequences, but the effect sizes are relatively small. We also see things like if you have two disorder regions in the same protein, their properties are also more similar to each other than if you look at two random disorder proteins in two different uh, proteins. Uh, but it's not a dramatic difference between you know, internal linkers and things at the end. One thing we did find, which I think was, was, was quite nice and interesting, is that, um, that if, you, if you look at, I mean, so if you have linkers that link two things together, a, a, a physical plausible mechanism would be that what matters for the biology is sort of the physical dimensions of, you know, how long, you know, in physical dimension is from A to B. And there was a really nice paper published a couple of years ago from another group that showed in one specific case, actually with two slims, this is work from, from the Lucia Chemistry group, that if you have two slims, the disordered regions in between them can vary in length uh, between different, you know, between different orthologs, but then the sequence composition as sort of adopts during evolution, so that if you have a, a long linker, then the sort of on average compaction per residue uh, is smaller so that you get more physical, you know, physical conservation of the distances. And so this, we since we have this model, we have all these uh, orthologs, we can then go in and find such examples. It turns out that we find many examples where at least the statistics shows that there is a strong, significant correlation between the per residue compaction and the length of the of these linkers. So I think that you know in the, in those cases, I think the sequence properties you know matter in some specific way, where it's sort of the the physical dimension that could also be conserved more than sort of the you know the, the average polymer uh, property. So I think linkers are special in that way, but otherwise we did not find a, a strong a strong signal. Interesting. Thanks, Shoshana. Yeah, I have a question. I, I wonder, you know, your I think your model would not allow this, but would you, uh, how would you change compaction properties as a function of ionic strength and pH? Um, so, um, what we, would what the we... sequence properties that would be more sensitive to this? So, so. I can, yeah, so it, it captures some aspect of that and some aspects it doesn't capture. And mm -hmm. the aspects that it captures, it captures not perfectly. So we have electrostatics in our model that is described by a by Huckel term, um, mm -hmm. which means that as long as what this salt is doing is screening electrostatics, yeah. we capture that to some extent. Mm -hmm. And we have looked at that uh, and we do capture to some extent, for example, if you measure salt dependence uh, of sex data, we do get some uh, agreement with that. Um, what I showed you right is when we move around the charged residues, mm -hmm. we capture those effects, which is, you know, you mm -hmm. know it's mm -hmm. nice. And of course, we also have, uh, again, it's pretty simplistic, but we do set the charge of the charged residues dependent on the pH. So we do a very simple approximation, okay, which yeah, of course yeah, is not okay, great, right? Thinking, yeah. okay. So we have a so we have a you know we have a fractional yeah. charge of the histidine depending on what the pH and mostly the you know the positive. Right. Okay. Of yeah. course, what yeah. we could do, and again others have done this, right? We could simulate mixtures of protonation states, and of course, you know, that is is entire is entirely possible. If you want to go at effects at higher salt, then of course it's no longer electrostatic screening, but it's also that you have you know, actually changing the interaction strength between the amino right, acids. Exactly. I mean, this is really important in the cell and, you know, that's, it's key. Yeah. yeah. So okay. we are, so we are, you know, we are very interested in that. Uh, there yeah. is unfortunately not a lot of good data that is probing yeah. these things, but this is again, something that, you know, we're interested in and, and working on. So I think if you wanted to design a sequence that changes its compaction 
uh, as a response to salt in the range between, let's say, 25 millimolar and 150 millimolar salt, I think we are in okay in the regime. If you wanted to change something that changes the compaction from, let's say, you know, 100 millimolar to one molar, you know, we're in the realm where this model doesn't okay, work. Okay, okay. But, but, you know, but you I think that there's hope um, to do it. Um, and we have some initial, we have some initial results that suggest that that could be possible, but it's okay. hard. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Then no more questions, I guess we can thank Kristen again. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was really nice. It's like, and um, I'll see the rest of us, all of you, in about a month, which yeah. we talk about more, more about essentials. Cecilia, what's her name? Uh, she's going to talk about uh, also machine learning for potentials. So, okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.